transitioning session. Um, we're going to talk a lot about transition from pediatric care to adult care. This is the first time that we're doing this kind of like panel discussion where Tracy and I are going to just kind of give you guys some background, tell our stories, um, tell you what the work that's being done, tell you about the work that's being done in transitioning in, in LGS and epilepsy. And then we're really going to leave it open to you for questions and to share your stories. Um, so are we ready to start? Okay, um, so Christi I'm Christina, for those of you who don't know me. Um, uh, I have a 20, uh, oh, geez, 20, 31 year old brother with LGS, and we've had a really, really interesting transition experience, and my parents are in the room too, and they can add to you know whatever I say. Um, but I'm gonna also kind of bring the perspective of a transitioning sort of, um, not, I, want, I don't want to call myself an expert at all, but what I've been doing over the last few years is um, involvement with um, a bunch of transitioning projects. So I've been working with the Child Neurology Foundation, which is an organization that represents basically all childhood neurologic disorders, and they've put together a really um, important campaign about the importance of understanding transition and also communication between pediatric and adult neurologists. And so in 2014, we published a, page, uh, a paper that went into the journal um, Neurology that basically laid out what was a consensus of how transitioning should go in terms of you know, when to start, what happens during the transition process, and how it should end in hopefully a, a positive way. And so I've been involved with that, and then I did my own research um, as part of my PhD that was looking at how families perceive transitions. Because what I found was that the, um, the medical community was saying that transitions were happening, and then I went to the families and they were saying completely different things. So I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, so I'm going to be wearing two hats. One as a sibling whose brother has gone through the transition, and then one as a, a researcher in this area. So I'll hand it over to Tracy now. Oh, great. Um, I'm Tracy Dixon Salazar, and I also wear uh, two hats. I have a 26-year-old daughter who we um, transitioned to adult care, and we moved from San Diego to Chicago. We transitioned in Chicago when we left pediatric neurology and went to adult neurology. And then we moved back to San Diego, moved to adult neurology, and now have now gone back to pediatric neurology in a um, what should never ever happen, but we just, so we have a lot of work to do in San Diego to, um, and I wanna talk about that experience. And then also on the science side with Christina, I just wanna talk about uh, where, from when she, she talks about kind of where we've gotten to, I wanna talk about what I see happening in the next year um, with the physicians about how uh, we're gonna make this better and, and move things forward and, and maybe how you guys can help from, from the research side. So I'm just going to throw it back to Tracy for a second because she had, um, <laughs> not to put you on the spot, but um, can you just explain why you were kind of went back to pediatrics and what that looked like? Sure. Um, I mean, I can just tell you that story now and then you can tell your story and then we can talk about science stuff. So, um, so uh, Savannah stayed in um, the Children's Hospital in San Diego, and this is very individualized based on your state and your, and your county and your hospital and the doctors. So uh, again, luck has a lot to do with it. That's our healthcare strategy in America, luck. And um, the uh, adult, the pediatric neurolog neurologist who is an epileptologist, I'm just going to call him Mark because I can't keep saying that, um, uh, would keep her until she was about 25, no problem. The problem is, is the hospital has regulations that say that you, they uh, may or may not admit somebody over the age of 18 to the children's hospital. So if she needed to, if she had an emergency and needed to be admitted, uh, if they were full or if somebody had a problem with her age, uh, they had a policy in place where she would be admitted. So there was a lot of incentive for us to, to transition. But we stayed with, she was doing pretty well, so we stayed in pediatrics. And then when we moved, when she was 22 years old, to Chicago, we said, we're going to bite the bullet and we're going to go to adult neurology. Uh, we met with six different adult neurologists in Chicago and finally found one that we really liked. Her name is Zoe Gerard. And uh, she was just um, really willing to work with us. So what I've learned in our transition experience is that Adult neurology just thinks very differently. It's not bad, it's not worse, it's not better, it's just different than pediatric neurologists. Our pediatric neurologists, um, they're all trained as pediatricians first. So they're trained in sort of the whole care of the child and they're used to working with a family. 
Adult neurologists are used to working with adults that have a medical condition that can speak for themselves. They're not used to work. Most of their patients, in general, and I'm speaking in general, this is not true for every doctor, but most of them uh, have a medical condition and are speaking for themselves and are not coming with a caregiver. Um, or they come with a caregiver, but they're still making their own medical decisions. In addition, adult neurologists work on the brain and the spinal cord. Um, so when you say to your adult neurologist, um, I have a problem with you know, constipation, for example, which we had that yeah, conversation, um, they just want to refer you out to GI. Or if you have a problem with behavior, they want to refer you out to uh, the behavioral people or the psychiatrists or um, so on. And, and, um, uh, and they want you to keep working through your general practitioner. And uh, if you've had any experience with outsiders outside of neurology who have, uh, work with our kids, they're terrified of them because they're on all of these medicines. So our general practitioner was like, he wants me to do what? You know, the adult neurologist. And then, and then you go to the psych people and they'd be like, all right, I'm gonna pr prescribe these psych meds for the behavior. And I'm like, so how do those interact with their anti-seizure meds? Oh, yeah, talk to your neurologist about that. And then you go talk to the neurologist. He'd be like, oh, you need to talk to the psych doctor about that. I'm like, is anyone gonna take responsibility for the drug interaction? Amen. No. And so you know who the quarterback of the team is? It's us. Yeah. And so, um, so we found an amazing doctor in Chicago, but it took us finding a lot of different doctors. And I think, again, your best resources is another parent who's got a kid who can say, there's a good ones, and here's the, the ones that weren't a good fit. And, and you have to be careful with that because your definition of, a, of what you want out of a doctor is different than some, what other people want, right? So some people just love doctors that just um, take full control, and, and others don't, and other people like doctors that go into extensive explaining detail, and so you have to know what you want in a doctor. But um, anyway, so to make my long story longer, uh, we moved back to Chicago, uh, from Chicago, we were in Chicago for two years, we moved back to San Diego, and we said, all right, we're gonna bite the bullet. And so we tried um, four different adult neurologists, and we finally found a lovely woman that I really liked at UCSD Healthcare, very level four epilepsy center adult neurologist. And um, we stayed with her for a few years, and we really liked her. But the whole philosophy there, um, and I'm, I'm kind of not, I'm putting on my scientist hat too, kind of the philosophy in adult neurology is a lot of them don't realize that our LGS kids and our Dravet kids grow up and end up in it. They're like, oh, they all die. It's a, that's a pediatric syndrome. Um, they either die before they get to me or it just goes away or so like it, there's this huge misconception we still meet doctors all the time they're like I don't have any Gervais syndrome patients you know because they all die before then I'm like no 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 15% of them do die and it's a really big problem but then they grow up and they come to you um, the other thing is is um, uh, they uh, don't really feel like the syndromes or the ideology uh, are necessarily important for what they need to do. So their philosophy, again, based on the, how many did I see, 10 or so, um, and the talking to physicians in my job for the last 20 years, is that um, we treat seizures. That's what we do. We are, we are brain doctors, we treat seizures and side effects. And so I just really need to know what kind of seizures you're having, and then I need to give you meds for that. And then if you have a behavior, I'm gonna send you here. If you have constipation, I'm gonna send you here. If you have kidney problems, I'm gonna send you here. Um, and so uh, they just need to know the seizure type. And so when you say things like, oh, well, my kid has Lennox Gastaut, and they're like, oh, well, that doesn't really matter. But it does matter because uh, a few reasons. There are now six approved FDA meds for Lennox Gastaut. So there's a whole group of people that are all of a sudden getting Lennox Gastaut all of a sudden because they want access to the, the two up dialects, basically. <laughs> um, and they may or may not have Lennox Gastaut, but now all of a sudden it's a fad to have it. So um, yay, but you know, join the club. But um, uh, so they um, don't really feel like the syndromes are important, and so the adults aren't finding the community. They, they haven't seen enough convincing data to show them that um, doing genetic testing in the adults is important, and, or that uh, pediatric neurologists have, 80% uh, of them do genetic testing now, and we've convinced them, but that took a long time, and adults aren't. And then, you know, when I go in and I say my kid responded to a drug, um, that's not a seizure drug because of her genetics, they look at me like I'm crazy. But I said, okay, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna work with you. And what, what really came to fruition was trying to balance the care, I quarterbacking between her general practitioner, her behavioral specialist, her, her uh, constipation person, um, oh, GI doctor, sorry, poor guy, he's a constipation doctor. And, uh, and, uh, and then all of her you know, services. And, and then um, when Epidiolics did come out, 
we, uh, we, so Savannah's been slowly weaning off her seizure meds because she's been doing so well since the age of 18. She's 26 now. And uh, she was up for a new VNS surgery. And so we said, hey, we're, uh, we're gonna turn it off and see, because we have no idea. The VNS is one of those things where it's like most of us think it's working, but aren't. She's gonna hippocampus me in a second. Um, anyway, uh, so we turned off her VNS. We saw a little bit of a spike in seizures. We wanted to go on Epidiolex and the doctor the adult neurologist was like, I'm gonna wait till the hospital trains me. And um, there was no sense of urgency, whereas pediatrics do. So we went back to the pediatric neurologist. And that should not have happened. Um, I hope that is not your experience. And with that, I'm gonna give it, that's our whole transition story, so I don't have to tell anything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Tracy, hippocampus. Um, uh, so I just want to get a sense of who's in the room um, and where you are kind of in the transition stage. So do we have anybody here that's under the age of four or child's under the age of 14? Oh, wow. There's a lot of you. My goodness. Okay. And anyone between 14 and 18? And then is there anyone in the, like above 18 that has not transitioned yet? Okay, wow. Okay, so I'm speaking to a crowd basically of the very early, which is great, because that's the be that's that's tends to be the consensus now, which was not a consensus, I would say maybe five years ago, is that this is the kind of stage between the age of like thirteen and fifteen is where transitioning the, the, the discussions on transitioning really should start happening. And you might ask, well, that's really early. Like I'm not thinking about my kid transitioning to adult care because they're still a kid. Um, but it's such a long process to transition. There's so much that needs to go into it. So if you are in those early stages, you guys are in a really good place to st start thinking about it. So just a, a quick anecdote from, from what we went through was Michael was um, 18 years old. He had not transitioned. And we did not, my parents did not have legal, legal guardianship because they didn't know that they needed to get legal guardianship for him. And he wound up having a psychotic episode and was committed into a, a mental health um, part of the hospital. And my parents couldn't, they did not have the authority to take him out because he was an adult. And so that's what was really, really scary. I know. Is mom in the room or no? No, she left. Uh, she doesn't want to hear me talk. Um, that was really scary for my mom because she's like, I'm his mother and I don't have control of taking him out of the hospital. And so, you know, transitioning is not just about going from pediatric to adult. It's understanding the whole system of getting legal guardianship, understanding what's going to happen after they're 18 or even 21 if they're still in the school system, working with the IEP and understanding how they that, that people can work together to make sure that after those after the age of 18 or 21 you know what is their future going to look like and so um, that's kind of the work that I do and I think that that's why I'm really passionate is because it happened and it was scary as heck when that happened to Michael so those are our stories but we really want to hear from you so um, if you have any qu immediate questions just raise your hand um, we don't have microphones being passed around, so you'll have to project your voice. Um, yeah? Um, I had my first real seizure when I was 17. It was wild of me to get medical power of attorney, uh, guardianship power of attorney. Oh, good. Oh, what? What are you know what I mean? <laughs> And a wheel, right? Oh, yeah. But you had the medical power of attorney, yeah. Which 
So part of the paper that Christina published um, uh, there, uh, it was put together by a whole group of people, but it really weighs heavily on the pediatric epilepsy side. And there's eight guiding principles to transition eight. And Christina will talk about these, but um, basically you start when they're like 12 to 14. And the first thing is, is to start to ask what that kid needs. Is this kid ever gonna be, well first, if they're not verbal, you know you're gonna need uh, guardianship, we call it conservatorship, and I just, in being in the community, I knew that, so we had it before Savannah turned 18 or shortly after. But once they become 18, they have full rights over themselves. So if, if your kids are nonverbal and can't take it, you're going to need to go through that process. And the foundation is just beginning to try to be helpful in that area and guide people, but it's state by state. Um, but then, then there's also these gradations, right? So maybe they will be able to make some of their decisions. Um, like in your case, and so um, maybe there's a limited guardianship, limited conservatorship, or maybe there's no conservatorship or guardianship, but there's a medical power of attorney that's granted to mom or dad, um, or oh, and you have the will, and then you've got you know um, whatever else needs to be signed, um, and then you know there then there's a whole group of people with epilepsy, which these rules apply to that will that need to learn about their medicine because one day they will take responsibility. Um, for their their lives and so that's part of these eight principles as well and I just want to add to Alyssa who's sitting right behind you she's going to be having a session um, that will address some of the the legal aspects of, of you know transition well transition will be part of it so make sure to check out her talk you had a question Tracy and I are fighting over the microphone. Um, yeah, yeah, it will. Um, and so the, the, the paper that we keep referring to, it's this Eight Common Principles. You know, it was written, um, I think, uh, kind of slanted towards those that could live more independently. And so, I mean, I had a seat at the table, but I feel like what needs to be done, this, the next level, is for those that are really nonverbal and are going to be assumed to never ind live independently. And that's not in the literature, really, or acknowledged. That was us too, um, and so our daughter won't live independently. So, and in, in, um, basically, to become a conservator, we're her guardians, but they call it conservators. Um, the rights are her rights are transitioned to us, and it's seven rights. It's like, and we, and you can, one of them is the right to vote, and that's optional. But the other rights are like, she can't enter enter to a contract, like a marriage contract or a, or a legal contract. Um, uh, she can't make medical decisions for herself and things, and so those rights were transferred to me and my husband. And um, it was a whole legal process and it took a while. So you need to start thinking about that now for your kid. And I can't tell you we know how to handle that in every state and every county because it's different. But what we can do is um, answer questions and try to help you get to the right resources if you're dealing with that. And then that's the first step. And then we'll talk about the other steps because I see some questions. Yeah. I think she had her hand up. Yeah, so I can answer that. Um, what's happening more and more, which is delightful to see, is that they're starting to do what's called transition clinics. So instead of just having the pediatric neurologist get on the phone with the adult neurologist and talk about the medical history of the child, um, they actually sit together in a room with other specialists and they come up with a, a complete plan. Now, that only exists in a few centers. I know, for example, I think CHOP um, in Philadelphia does that, um, but it's, they're trying to push for that to become more common. The problem is billing and insurance because it costs a lot to get everybody in the same room at the same time. So um, I would hope, I'm hopeful that this will kind of get worked out, but ultimately it's all about money. Yeah. So, yeah. And we have a couple of questions. I don't know who is next. I, I think I saw him, I saw Sarah, I saw this lady here. Um, 
I mean, uh, which is Beth, sorry, Beth. And then there was another one back. But. So let's start with Stephanie, she's in the front. <laughs> That's a really, really good point. And um, again, planning early is critical. Um, the other thing, you know, I'm just going to speak from the sibling side as well, is I've spoken to a lot of other siblings who felt um, pressured that they were going to be responsible if something happened to the parents. And that discussion, again, I think is really important to have. And, and if you do have an only child, that's even, I think, more important because it sometimes falls on the siblings too. My other daughter also has doctors. They're not as good as mine, but you know, people will need to know how to take care of her as well. So yeah. it's sort of a way to take care of the whole family. But my question is, what I don't know is, you know, because when you have small families, people are sort of in generations, and like in my family, an entire generation passed away in like the same two years, and so then there's the next generation, and it's like four people. And what So uh, I'll just answer that really quickly. Um, so we're we're not even there yet. We're just talking about transitioning. But um, some of us, you know, that are are older and have systems, we have to figure out which systems are the best. We have multiple contingency plans. The problem is, is they change every couple of years. And so when you start thinking about um, transition planning and what happens after you go, every couple of years you have to rethink it. What I will say is that as she's gotten older, it's been a little bit easier to identify. Um, we never thought my son would ever reach an age, uh, a mental age of responsibility. <laughs> uh, he's 27, and now he is kind of stepping into that. Now we have to change the paperwork again, but we had some contingencies where he would handle sort of the oversight and someone else would handle the finances. Um, so they would work together and then we had a backup to that. And then there have been some nieces and nephews that have sort of risen up as, so it, as they get older, but when they're really young, it's terrifying <laughs> because you know, you're like, oh, they're so dependent. And, yeah. There are. Yeah, Alyssa. Yeah. Alyssa's gonna be.
Um, we'll take the question. I had a question about uh, a comment and a question. How do you work through that bureaucracy at the hospital? That, that, that cell, the, the, it's not necessarily the doctors that can't coordinate, but they've got that bureaucracy in between them. One of the reasons we moved to Colorado Springs mm -hmm. <coughs> when there's a pediatric neurologist that took care of Willie for 10 and a half years. He said the children's hospital is a business now. It is not taking care of the patients. And he encouraged us. He said Colorado is going to be the best place for Lily because of research and intelligence that's going on. How do you work through that bureaucracy where your kids might be through like this? Yeah. So um, I would love to tell you that you're going to be able to change bureaucracy, and you're not. The way that we've worked through it is two things. One is tenacity. So I happen to be married to somebody that loves to argue with insurance companies and yeah, doctors. And yeah, I mean, he lives for that. So he's, he calls himself my, um, my big guns. When I need to pull out the big guns, I bring in the crazy husband. And, um, and so if you're lucky enough, most of us are just too tired to argue. But um, it really is just a tenacity. The second thing is you, it, for each individual sen uh, scenario, you need to figure out why they aren't doing what you need them to do. Yeah. And so, like we we got uh, we weren't approved for the ketogenic diet, and it ended up we couldn't get, figure out why why why, and it ended up being something silly like dietitians weren't covered, but we'd cover everything else, the hospitalization, the you know all the doctors, and so we said, well, can we get you to write it with no dietitian, or can we go somewhere where dietitian is billed separately, and then we'll just pay for that. And so, if you can figure out the why, and then address it, and then always, and then the third thing I would just say is that. Mm -hmm. Um, we're all in this together. So yes, the squeaky wheels do get the grease, and if you you know um, lay down uh, and throw a tantrum, you will get attention. But if you can try to figure out how to work within the system, the doctors are just so overworked too, and they're being beholden to um, really unreasonable standards. So, and I just want to add too, there's now um, for a billing code for transition. So if you if the doctors need to spend an hour speaking with one another, they can actually bill it now. So and I, I don't think a lot of the physicians know that. So and I know you've had a question for a while. So yeah. Oh, I asked. Oh, okay, okay. Did we have another? Sorry. I don't know what's happened over the last five years that really brought this push up. Um, I think it's just a lot of different, a lot of different entities have kind of come together, realizing that this is such an unmet need. And so the Child Neurology Foundation um, has been a big impetus behind, you know, publishing these papers. But then also industry, some of the pharmaceutical companies have been really interested in funding different, you know, like webinars and CME, CME types of um, uh, projects that really discuss this. And so I see it like in an upward type of you know, movement, but, and the foundation is trying to do as much as we can um, as well. So from on the, on the doctor's side, it's become a hot topic. Remember when SUDEP was never talked about and then it was, so it is becoming a hot topic. And I think it's because, like I said yesterday, and I, I, and I didn't mean to imply that, that this was everybody, but a lot of the, um, the kids are staying home now. You know, it's like, it, it, but before there were, there were, that they were primarily institutionalized, but bless the ones that, you know, we can learn from that are older. Um, so it is really being pushed forward. There are these eight guiding principles. The doctor, the pediatrician is supposed to identify the adult uh, neurologist. A lot of the pediatricians are actually keeping their LGS kids for as long as they can. You just need to understand your policies locally at that hospital and in your state. Um, so, uh, and, and um, uh, Amy Brin from Child Neurology will slap me for this statement, but right now I'm actually recommending that our LGS kids for at least like the next two years until this hot topic starts to bubble up into something more than just conversation, mm -hmm. like actual action, to hang out in Pete's epileptology. Yeah. And um, I've, in my research that I did with the families, I, um, I interviewed about 40 families, and 39 of them were over the age of 25, and they were all in pediatric neurology still. 
four out of 40 I think it was 39 I think there was only one or two families that had actually transitioned out and one of them was Karen Groff who I don't know if is in the room um, it's a big it, it happens so often in the LGS community that that not only do the parents want to stay with the pediatric neurologist because they consider them family but the pediatric neurologists don't want to let them go either it's so are saying that they don't um, they don't feel comfortable transitioning the care to the adult doctors because they don't really know each other. It's not that there are bad adult doctors; they just don't know each other. I'm like, no, no, this is because they are QBS's family. All right, so we have time for just like a, maybe a couple of questions. I know Sherry had her hand up, so and then Elizabeth. Yeah, so it's I think I'm pretty sure it's linked on there. Um, it's an open access paper, so you don't have to pay for it, um, and you can find it there. Yeah, okay, Elizabeth. Okay. All right, so one more question. I was just going to say, just really roughly, the eight principles are basically, you know, figure out where your kid's at. What, what is their future going to look like based on where they are at right now at 12 and, and revisit it every year. Um, uh, so figure out what the transition will look like. Um, and then start to prepare the child, if they're mentally able, to take responsibility for their own medical care, which is not most of us. Start to prepare the parent for what is coming. And then uh, again, revisit it every year. I'm not giving you all eight because I don't remember them exactly, but these are all of them. And then, um, and then uh, you'll begin to identify adult neurologists early if there is going to be a transition. Conversations will start, letters will be written, and uh, joint appointments will happen. And then uh, when the handoff happens at 18 or whenever, uh, everybody's prepared for it. So it's really general stuff. And what we're doing scientific wise is trying to now apply that to the most severe kids. And also to train up the adult neuros to receive the football and understand what the, that was the biggest thing for me. I've been in this field 20 years and I was shocked that I didn't realize that adult neurology was so different. I didn't realize it. And so I think things are going to change. It's exciting time because at least it's getting some attention. But um, it's going to be, it's going to take a few years for it to bubble up. And we have to retrain the adult neuros to think a little bit differently about our kids. All right, well, I think we are out of time, but thank you. And if you guys have questions, just let Tracy, or just hunt us down and uh, let us know. So thank you. I hope that was helpful and informative.